All right, Lucy, take it away. And thank you for taking us on an adventure to the beach today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Erin. Hello, everyone. My name is Lucy. I'm an interpreter for California State Parks. And today I'm coming to you from a town called Encinitas. Encinitas is in northern San Diego County in Southern California. And to help me with a quick mic check, go ahead and hit the hand raise button at the bottom to make sure you heard where I'm at, what my name is. Perfect. Thank you all so much. Throughout the program today, I'm going to ask you to hit that hand raise button at different times. It's a great way for you and I to connect, okay? All right, wonderful. Now, I know we're starting a little bit late, so do me a quick favor. If you don't have a piece of paper or something to write with in front of you, go grab it. You have 30 seconds. Ready? Go. It can be anything. Markers, colored pencils, pens, whatever your heart desires and a few pieces of paper because we're gonna be doing some fun activities today. All right, time is up, welcome back. So today we're gonna to be talking about some, sen some sensational stinging survivalist, the jellies. Now, some of you might be wondering, okay, jellies, is that the same thing as a jellyfish? Absolutely. Jellies and jellyfish are the same types of animals. But I'm going to do my best to say jellies throughout the program today because scientists are trying really hard to get people to stop saying jellyfish because jellies aren't even fish at all. They're in a totally different type of classification. Think of fish way over here and jellies way over here. Now, I am still learning to try and call jellyfish jellies, so keep me honest. Throughout the program today, if you hear me say jellyfish, hit the hand raise button so I can see. That way I keep myself saying jellies. Raise your hand if you can do that for me. I love it. Thank you all so much, friends. So we are going to meet together for about 45 minutes today. And throughout the program, you might notice that there are people walking behind me. I am at San Alejo State Beach, which is a California state park, and we currently are open for some recreational activities. Now, that being said, we have to make sure we follow safe health standards so we can remain open. So I'm going to make sure I maintain six feet at all times between anyone walking behind me. I also want to let you know I washed my hands with soap and water before the program. I'll rewash them once we're done. I also sanitize all of my equipment. I'll re-sanitize it again. And also, if I do have to cough or sneeze, I will do it into the crease of my elbow. So keep practicing good health standards at home. That way we all can get back out to our parks. All right. So jellies seem rather simple. I'm curious how many of you have ever seen Looks like quite a few of you have seen jellies. I love it. To give us a quick refresher, and for anyone who's never seen a jelly, I have a task for all of you. I want you to get a piece of paper and that's something to write with ready because you are going to think like scientists. You are going to have a chance to observe jellies. And as we're observing jellies, we're going to have an entire minute to write down as many observations as possible. So maybe what do you notice about them? What do they make you wonder? And what do they even remind you of? Now, before we do observe jellies, I just want to point out that we do not have the Q&A section open. So throughout the program today, if you do have a question for me, you can take a picture of this slide. Go ahead and tag me on Instagram or Facebook at either CA State Parks SD or at the Ports Program. So again, if you have any questions today, reach out. I would love to help answer them. Wonderful. All right. So my scientists, with your scientists' brains making observation skills, you have an entire minute to observe the moon jelly. The moon jelly is a species that is found right here at San Alejo State Beach. I'm putting a minute on my timer here. 
On your marks, get set, observe. Again, be writing down all of those observations. What do you notice? What do they make you wonder? And what do they even remind you of? All right, friends, we're about halfway there. You have 30 more seconds to write down as many observations as possible. Wonderful job, everyone, writing utensils down. Let's take a breath because, man, observing animals really gets our brain thinking, right? So read over what you just wrote down. Take a look at it. And as you're reading it, if you observe the same thing I did, I want you to raise your hand for me. So one thing I noticed about the moon jellies is that they are rather clear. Looks like a lot of you noticed that too. All right. They made me wonder how they move so gracefully. It looks like a lot of you wonder that as well. And one thing jellies that they remind me of while observing those moon jellies is that they kind of remind me of aliens. They look like nothing else on our planet. It seems that a lot of us think alike. I think we're gonna get along swimmingly throughout our program today. Now, using your observation skills, what you notice about the jellies, I have a question for you. And if you have someone sitting next to you, a sibling or a parent, I want you to ask them what they think. Because my question for you is, who do you think came first on earth? Dinosaurs or jellies? Hmm, who is the older organism? Hmm, I think to help us visualize, having a timeline would be pretty helpful. Would you agree? A timeline of life on earth? I think so. Let's take a look at a timeline. So here we have my timeline of life on earth. To help you organize your thoughts, I would love for you to place dinosaurs and jellies on this timeline. Wait a minute, a lot of you are raising your hand. Are you wondering why there are three time periods? That's a little peculiar, right? Great observation skills. I want you to not only place dinosaurs and jellies on this timeline, but you and me, of course, where did humans first arrive on earth? Now, a quick refresher of timelines. The older something is, the farther on the left it's going to be. So we can see the Cambrian period started 500 million years ago. That is a very long time. And then we have the Triassic period right after it, beginning 200 million years ago. And the youngest time period on the far right, the quaternary period that began 1.8 million years ago. So I'm gonna give you 20 seconds to place humans, dinosaurs, and jellies on this timeline. If you have someone sitting next to you, work it out together. Teamwork makes the dream work. Ready, go. A lot of you, it seems, don't even need these full 20 seconds. I love it. And time's up. Let's see who came first between dinosaurs, humans, and jellies. All right, I need a favor from all of you. Drum roll on your tables. Da -da 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 -da. Who is it? Who's the oldest? Well, look at that. Jellies are older than dinosaurs. Can you believe that? How many of you guess that jellies are older than dinosaurs? Hit that hand raise button. 
Looks like a lot of you, great job. Way to use your observation skills and even deductive reasoning, thinking about how old dinosaurs are and how they seem complex, but jellies are a little bit more simple looking. So of course, they're gonna be a little bit older. So between humans and dinosaurs, who's the next oldest species? Dinosaurs, you are absolutely correct. Unfortunately, in current day, we don't have dinosaurs roaming the earth. So obviously they are much older than us. So that means humans first arrived in that quaternary period, 1.8 million years ago. How many of you got the entire order right? Raise your hand. It seems we have many young scientists in the making. I love that. Come be a fellow scientist with me. Well done. Now thinking like a scientist, you might be wondering, okay, Lucy, I guess the jellies are older, but how do we know for sure? Well, think about the last time you went to a museum and you walked into the dinosaur exhibit. What was the proof in that exhibit that dinosaurs once roamed the earth? Fossils, yes, very good. Fossils are like a timestamp, right? But do jellies have fossils? Hmm. How many of you observed in the moon jellies that they did not have any bones? Lots of you. So yes, even though jellies do not have bones, occasionally we can find jelly fossils. They are very rare. But what the jelly fossils have told us is that they are far older than dinosaurs, almost twice as old. Mind blown, right? Because they seem so simple. And what's even crazier is to think that jellies are still around to this day. So one thing my timeline did not show all of you is that between the Cambrian period and present day, there have been five mass extinctions. Now let's break that term down, mass extinctions. Mass means many. Extinction means gone forever. An example of an extinct species are the dinosaurs or even the dodo bird. So between that, these 500 million years, five different periods of events have wiped out dinosaurs, woolly mammoths, and many other species, yet jellies are still alive to this day. Now, how do you think this is possible that jellies have managed to survive for 500 million years? Again, if you have someone sitting next to you, ask them, get their thoughts. Maybe even write it down if you don't have someone sitting next to you. How do you think they managed to survive for so long? Hmm. Well, I can tell you that when I was young, about all of your age, I heard something from you have heard this. Looks like a few of you have heard this, that jellies can live forever. Well, I am sad to say that that is a myth. There is no scientific evidence to prove that jellies have been able to live forever. How they've managed to survive for so long are for two main reasons. The first is that they have a successful reproduction and a crazy life cycle that we're gonna dive into. The second reason is they are highly adaptable. How many of you have heard the term adaptable before or adaptations? Wonderful. It looks like a lot, a lot of you have heard this term before. So highly adaptable means being able to adjust to your surroundings to make sure that you survive. And jellies have some pretty fascinating adaptations that we're gonna talk about. And it allows them to live in every part of our ocean, in the bright light environments like this, in the dark depths of the ocean, in freezing cold waters, and even warmer waters too. Now, even though they are highly adaptable, one thing I want you all to keep in mind is that just like any other organism, they have a preferred habitat, a place that they thrive. So my place that I would thrive, my habitat, would be somewhere that's about 70 degrees, kind of like this, where I can go to the ocean 
and I can also cuddle with my cat. That is my perfect habitat. What's your perfect habitat? What would you need? Those are some interesting ideas. Hmm. Well, jellies, their preferred habitat are warmer waters. So as we learn about how they are sensational stinging survivalists, I want you to keep that in the back of your brain. Jellies prefer warmer waters. All right, so I mentioned the first thing that helps jellies survive is their life cycle. It is extremely successful. And to help us understand their life cycle, I need a favor from all of you. I need you to stand up with me. Take a step back from your screen because we are gonna get some movements in because even though jellies seem simple, there is more than meets the eye. Their life cycle is completely complex. So when I talk about a life cycle, I'm talking about their different stages of life. When I was younger, in about second grade, I had a teacher who walked in with a mesh basket and in it, there were little eggs. And from those eggs came caterpillars. And those caterpillars grew and ate so much food, they formed a chrysalis. And from that chrysalis, a beautiful monarch butterfly emerged. So that is an example of a life cycle. How many of you have seen the monarch butterfly life cycle before? Lots of you, wonderful. So I want you to imagine that life cycle as we go through the jelly life cycle. Because much like that little caterpillar completely changes into a butterfly, the same thing happens with jellies. All right, so to start our life cycle, I need you to put your arms up and we're making one big circle. So it's all one big time around. Let's do it two more times. This is the jelly life cycle. All right, so starting at the top of the jelly life cycle, we are going to have the adult jelly, which is called a medusa. Let's say that together, medusa. So we're gonna make our best impersonation of a jelly. Mine's kind of like this. Whatever you think the adult jelly should look like, go ahead and give that best move. Because from this Medusa jelly, they are going to lay eggs. So then we become an egg. So we are now at the first stages of the jelly life cycle. And this egg is gonna be floating through the open water until all of a sudden these weird things start growing. These little fringes are called cilia. Cilia are hair-like structures that help the larva stage to move. So now we went from an egg to a larva and we are kind of trying to find a good place in the ocean where we can settle down. So we're looking for a nice hard substrate like a rock. And once we find one, we're gonna plop. We are now attached. We cannot move from that surface. And here at this surface, what's gonna happen is all these little cilia are gonna be grabbing small microorganisms called plankton from the water. It's gonna help feed this next stage that's called the polyp. So you have nice long arms and at the end of the polyp, you can grab even bigger organisms in the water to help you feed and grow because just like we need food to grow bigger and stronger, so do jellies. So this polyp stage is grabbing a bunch of food, a bunch of food until all of a sudden it gets big enough and it's ready to become a jelly. So what happens here is when we have all the nutrients in the polyp stage, all of a sudden we have these layers that start forming. So make some layers. Do, do, do. And each of these layers are going to pop off. One, two, which is gonna pop off left and right. And each layer that pops off becomes an ephyra. Let's say that together, ephyra. Now ephyra is a juvenile jelly, kind of like all of you. If you were a part of the jelly stage, this would be you. You're not quite an adult, but you're not quite babies anymore. So these ephyra are gonna float in the ocean and get more and more nutrients until they become fully grown to the medusa. So we went all the way around our circle back up to that adult stage. Oh, my goodness. Is that way more complicated than you originally thought? It looks like a lot of you are thinking, yes, yes. But I think that we can go through that life cycle a little bit faster. Do you think we can go faster? Challenge accepted. A lot of you think we can go a little bit faster. So let's go a little bit faster. Are we ready? Start from the top. Life cycle. 
Medusa. Egg. Larva. Polyp. Don't forget to grab the food. And then we're ready, we're layering. And then it's popping off. And then we have a Fyra. And then Medusa. Whew. That was so much faster. I honestly don't think I could go any faster. Do you think you could go any faster? Oh man, a lot of you think you're going faster. All right, challenge accepted. One last time. Let's see if you can go faster than me. Are we ready? Okay. On your marks, get set. Jelly life cycle. Medusa. Egg. Lava. Bullet. Layering. Ephira. Medusa. Whew. Okay, I'm tired. You all wore me out. I think you went much faster than I did. Pat on the back because I cannot possibly do that again. Whew. Man, so a lot more complicated than we originally thought, right? They go through an entire metamorphosis, much like the monarch butterfly. And this life cycle is so successful. They are able to, as we saw, lay eggs that float in the ocean. All they have to do is find a hard place where they can collect nutrients from the water, all those small microorganisms to grow. So that's why it can happen anywhere in the ocean as long as they find that hard spot. And what's even crazier is that there's even more to the life cycle of the jelly. The jellies, are, it's not just about that full one we saw. They also have the ability to clone themselves. That's like out of a sci-fi movie. They truly must be aliens, right? Now let's take a look at the moon jelly life cycle. What we just went through, to help us visualize, I have a beautiful graphic. So as we saw, we went through all of our exercises from that adult Medusa all the way around back to the top. So I want you to pick where in the jelly life cycle you think they can clone themselves. Where do you think they have that option? It looks like many of you are itching and tell me. All right, so let's take a close look. If you guessed the polyp stage, pat on the back, well done. Yes, at the polyp stage, they do have the ability to split the polyp in half. To have two different polyps now releasing a phyra into the ocean environment crazy to have two different options. So by being able to observe their environment and see what's available to them, they can choose to either go that entire life cycle if that makes the most sense at the time. But if that doesn't make sense, they can also clone themselves. Whoa, how complex is that? And how successful is it too, right? Now, what was the second thing I mentioned that helped jellies be the sensational singing survivalists they are? They are highly adaptable. To help us with their adaptations, I need you all to do me a favor. Grab your piece of paper and something to write with because we are going to be drawing our very own jellies. Here is a model of a jelly I have right here. Give you a good visualization before we begin. So again, you can grab any colors you would like. And as we are drawing our jellies, I encourage you to draw them as big or as small as you would like because jellies come in all different shapes and sizes. As a matter of fact, I want you to take a quick look at your pinky fingernail. Take a look at that, the size of it. That is the size of the world's smallest jelly. Now, what about the world's largest jelly? Well, I can't even show you with my arms. From the top of the bell, which is this part right here, from one side to the other, they are six feet across. They are called the lion's mane jelly, and their tentacles can be upwards of 50 feet long, so way behind me. I can't even show you how far away 50 feet is. 
So you can draw the first part of the jelly as big or as small as you would like, because we are drawing the bell, that iconic shape. Now again, you can add any color you would like as well, because they come in different colors too. I am going to be drawing the purple striped jelly. That is another local species that can be found here at San Alejo State Beach. I'm gonna add some purple stripes. Perfect. Now here in the bell, this is the majority of the jelly. This is where everything is for them, how they move, what helps them to survive. So they have some pretty amazing adaptations in their bell. Before we dive into that though, some of you are wondering, okay, we have their major shape, but what about their eyes? Where do their eyes go? Hmm. They don't have true eyes like you and I do. Jellies have an eye spot. And this spot is able, allows the jellies, excuse me, to detect light and dark. They can't see true pictures like you and I do. So they have an eye spot. Okay, so they don't really have eyes. They must have a heart, right? I mean, they are a living animal. Where do you think the heart goes? Trick question. Jellies do not have hearts. They don't even have a brain. They have a giant nerve net that allows them to navigate in the waters. Okay, if they don't have a heart, then they must have lungs, right? I mean, they have to breathe oxygen like you and I do. They are a living thing. And yes, jellies do breathe oxygen. However, they do not have lungs. How jellies breathe is through their epidermis. It's this layer right here. How many of you have heard the term epidermis before? Lots of you, wonderful. You all have an epidermis and you're looking at my epidermis right now. Epidermis is the scientific word for skin. So jellies are able to breathe through their skin. It's called gas exchange. Can you think of any other animal in the world that can breathe through their skin? Hmm. For any of my friends that love amphibians, like frogs, you're probably thinking frogs. And absolutely, some frogs can breathe through their skin. All right, so we know they don't have eyes, they don't have lungs, they don't have a heart or a brain, but how are they able, even able to just be a solid jelly? Well, jellies are made up of about 98% water. The other 2% is a tissue-like substance called the mesoglea. So go ahead and draw a nice like half moon shape throughout your jelly that is where actual jelly is within the jelly. This mesoglea gives them more of a structure that allows them to stay a little bit more upright in the bell. And this mesoglea also helps them to swim, to move around in the ocean. And how many of us think that jellies are fantastic swimmers? Raise your hand. All right, we're kind of 50-50, and it's kind of a trick question because while well, yes, they do live in the water, so they have to be great swimmers, they don't have the best sense of direction, being able to propel themselves in different directions. Jellies typically can only go up and down, as we observed in our moon jellies. So what I want you to do for me is put your hand out like this, and then make a fist. And I want you to pretend that you're trying to pick up or grab your fist, but you just can't quite grab it. Your hand keeps slipping. So do this a few times. What does this hand remind you of? The jellies, absolutely. So this is similar to how jellies propel themselves. So imagine this is the jelly and this is water. What they'll do is contract their mesoglea and push water through their bell from the underside closing that space, which allows them to then move. This is called jet propulsion. So by closing that gap with the airspace with our fingers, it's mimicking how jellies close that space in the water. Kind of like your own Medusa jelly. Even this relaxes me. How many of you find jellies relaxing? Did you observe that when we were watching the moon jellies earlier? Yeah, it seems so simple. 
But as we know, there's more than meets the eye. And looking at our jelly, we have not finished drawing our jelly. We are missing the most iconic part of the jelly. Tell me what it is. Tentacles, well done. As I said, future scientists in the making, I'm loving all of your observation skills. All right, so we need to add our tentacles. So go ahead and add as many as you would like, as long or short, as thin or thick as you want, but do me a favor, leave space on both sides of the bell. All right, I think that's enough tentacles for me. I ask you to leave the space because jellies do not have one type of tentacle. They have two types. So what I want you to do on the outer edge is draw some, a tentacle that's a little bit longer and a little bit thicker. I'm gonna add some purple to mine because I think that's fun. Now we know these tentacles are for stinging. Very good, yes, these tentacles are for stinging. But what are these for? These tentacles are called oral arms. Hmm. Knowing the name of these tentacles, you can guess what they're used for, right? So I want you to imagine for a moment that your writing utensil is a fish. And our happy little fish is swimming throughout the ocean, having a great day, and all of a sudden it runs right into the jelly. So we know these tentacles are going to sting this fish. So this fish is going to become paralyzed. It won't be able to move. Now jellies, as we saw, they are very slow and relaxing moving. They can't move too fast. So these tentacles allow them to trap their prey while these oral arms will slowly move and push the fish up into their mouth. Now their mouth is on the underside of their bell, just one opening. They will push it up into their mouth. The jelly will digest it. And then from the same opening, anything that they don't wanna keep, any nutrients, just like we push out nutrients too, will come out through that same opening. So we can see that tentacles are used for them to eat. It's part of their eating adaptations, as well as their oral arms to help them grab their food. Now jellies, part of the reason they've survived for so long is that they have a very broad diet. They are not picky eaters. I'm a very picky eater, so I would not survive very long out in the ocean. Jellies will eat fish, fish eggs, small crustaceans, plankton, and even other jellies. Why do you think a jelly would want to eat another jelly? Competition, very good, yes. Because if I'm the moon jelly we saw earlier, and this is the purple striped jelly, that's a little bit bigger than I am. I'm competition, I eat the same thing that the purple striped jelly eats. So the purple striped jelly eats me, he no longer has to compete with me for food. So that's why sometimes other jellies will eat different species of jelly. So their diet is broad. They have those stinging cells to capture food. But I'm sure many of you are thinking, wait a minute, those stinging cells, those tentacles, they can also help to protect the jelly. How many of you are thinking this? Wonderful, lots of you. Yes, jellies can use their nematocysts. Let's say that together, nematocysts. That's the name for their stinging cells to help them defend themselves from bigger predators. Now, stinging cells are not the only defensive adaptation that jellies have. A few species of jellies also have camouflage. I asked us all earlier, how many of us observed that jellies were transparent, those moon jellies? That transparency, wonderful. Are you saying, yes, I did, I did. Wonderful, yes, that transparency with the moon jellies helps them to blend in to the bright light waters of the ocean. And here I have the red belly comb jelly. That is a mouthful. That is the jelly on the bottom right hand side of the screen. I want you to say red belly comb jelly five times fast because I can never seem to do it. Red belly comb jelly, red belly comb jelly, red belly comb jelly, red belly comb jelly, red belly comb jelly. Whew, okay. 
Now that I've got that out of my system, that red belly comb jelly, that bright red color will help it to blend into the dark depths of the ocean because red light cannot be seen below 200 meters. So that helps them to blend into the environment. Many of you also probably observed that they also have these weird flux of light on the red belly comb jelly and that spotted comb jelly. What we are seeing is bioluminescence, the ability to glow. Some jellies do have this ability to flash different colors of light. Now thinking about that bioluminescence, that can definitely help them to get away from predators, but how? Well, let's think about it in the sense that you are that red belly comb jelly and you are giving off that bioluminescence because maybe you're trying to attract another red belly comb jelly to come and say hi, but instead it attracts the attention of a predator. So a predator's interested in this coming over. If you keep flickering, flashing, throwing that bioluminescence out there, that might attract the attention of another predator that might just be bigger than that first predator. So if we have the biggest predator around, do you think they'd rather go over, go after a small, tiny jelly or the bigger predator? That slightly bigger predator than the jelly, right? Because that makes more sense for that big predator to eat all of that predator. So that allows you as a jelly to swim out of there. Does that not seem completely complicated for a seemingly simple animal. Wow. Even with stinging cells, camouflage and bioluminescence though, jellies are managed to be eaten by 150 species. So I'm not just saying 150 individual animals, but 150 different types of animals feast on jellies. So knowing this, I want you to think with someone sitting next to you, if you don't have someone, that's okay too. You can write it down. Do you think jellies are important in the food web? Knowing that they are consumed by 150 different types of animals. While we're pondering that question, I'd like to introduce you to two predators of the jelly. Here we have two different predators of the jelly. We have the gorgeous and goofy looking mola mola. That is the beautiful fish on the bottom left. And that third name, mola mola, is so fun to say. Say it with me, mola mola. Say it in a loud voice, mola mola. Quiet voice, mola mola. Goofy voice, mola mola. I cannot get enough of it. These giant fish will feast heavily on jellies. Now to the right of our mola mola, we also have the endangered leatherback sea turtle. How beautiful. Oh, and a few of you observed that I said endangered leatherback sea turtle. Now endangered is not part of their name. That is their status. What that means is that endangered, they are slowly declining in population. We are losing endangered leatherback sea turtles throughout our oceans. Now, leatherback sea turtles, their favorite meal are the jellies. They will migrate or move thousands of miles all the way from Indonesia to the coast of California to eat hundreds of pounds of jellies a day. Hundreds of pounds, I mean, imagine that. I mean, I would be pretty starving too, traveling thousands of miles. I would just be chomping at every passing jelly left and right, not even questioning it. Here I go, bit right into this jelly. Wait a minute. This isn't a jelly, is it? Let's take a closer look at what I just bit into. How many of you noticed before you even bit into it that this was a produce bag from the grocery store? Yeah, lots of you, well done. And as it's floating though, here in the wind, does it not remind you of those moon jellies 
we saw earlier. I mean, even the way it kind of moves around, the way it catches the draft. Now here above water, it's pretty easy for us to tell this is a plastic bag. So let's dive deeper. Let's take a look at what it would look like underwater, shall we? Here I have a beautiful photograph of my dear friend, Erica, who works for California State Parks. And on this day, she was doing diving to collect plastics from our oceans. Now looking in her left hand, you can see that clearly looks like plastic. I can tell that out. But what about in her right hand? Does that plastic bag not look exactly like a moon jelly to you? I mean, look how difficult it is to see that. And we as humans know that plastic is a thing. It is around, it's present in our worlds. But if you were a leatherback sea turtle, you would have no idea. And it's not just the sea turtles, it's also the other jellies because jellies also eat, as we mentioned, other species. So plastics can be very harmful to our ocean environment, to the sensational survivalists and even sea turtles. So it's important to try and do our part to stop using as many single use plastics. And it's not just plastic bags, it's also plastic saran wrap or plastic film packaging because plastic can never truly disappear. It's just gonna break down further and further. Now, before I leave this picture, I'm curious because I have so many future scientists in the making, how many of you observed the sea turtle behind Erica? Well done, pat on the back. Yes, it's just to the left of her hand. That is a green sea turtle right behind her. My goodness, we have been on quite the journey today. I mean, we went back in time and discovered that jellies are older than dinosaurs and that they are sensational seeing survivalists because of that crazy su successful life cycle. And also they're highly adaptable, being able to be in every ocean environment, having those wonderful eating adaptations, a broad diet, and all of those cool defensive adaptations too. So even though we dove into their past, what do you think lies in the future for jellies? You can ask someone sitting next to you or even jot down, what do you think is going to happen in the future for jellies? One thing I can think about, and if you have the same idea, I want you to raise your hand. One thing I'm thinking about is that in the back of my brain, I'm remembering that jellies prefer warmer waters. Very good. Yes, they prefer warmer waters. And right now, our Earth is going through a warming period due to climate change. And that means that our ocean waters, our temperature are, is getting warmer. So if we have warmer ocean waters, that means more jellies are going to be in the ocean. So is that a good thing? Because I mean, 150 species eat jellies. Yes, that is true. However, we have to remember that jellies have a broad diet. They eat fish, fish eggs, small plankton, and many other organisms that live in the ocean rely on the same food source as jellies. And as we know, they are sensational at surviving. They don't need a lot. They're able to be in all different types of environments. So as our temperatures are getting warmer, more jellies could cause a huge problem. Because imagine all you want to do is dive into the ocean, go for a swim or go surfing, go sea kayaking. But there are so many jellies out there that you just get stung. How is that enjoyable for you? So one thing we all can do is to remember that jellies are sensational at surviving. They don't really need our help in surviving. However, all the other animals in the surrounding ocean need our help because too much of a good thing cannot be that great, right? So we all need to do our part to make sure that jellies aren't too good at surviving and outcompete the other animals we love. So one way we can do this is after the program today, I want you to analyze 
what you do at home. Because what you do at home has a great impact on the world we live in. For one example, every time you leave the room without turning off the light, that's using electricity. Or maybe every time you forget to unplug your electronics when you're done charging, that also uses electricity. Or maybe it can be something as simple as analyzing what you drink out of every day. So one thing that I have been doing for three years is drinking out of this beautiful water bottle. I'm not gonna tell you what brand it is, but you can see it's a lovely bottle it's stainless steel, keeps my water nice and cold. And every time I use this, I don't have to use a plastic bottle. Now, plastics are not only just bad for the environment, because as we saw, animals can eat them, but plastic, in order to make it, we have to use oil. And using oil can affect climate change. It can make our earth even warmer. So maybe go buy a cool water bottle, put some awesome stickers on it, personalize it. You can see I added some stickers for my trips to Costa Rica and Japan, and it's my own personality. So analyze the small things you do every day at your home so it can truly add up and make a world of difference. It can be something as simple as hang drying your laundry instead of using the dryer. So I wanna take this moment to thank all of you for joining me here on this journey of the sensational singing survivalists. I really hope you all have learned that jellies, even though they seem so simple, I mean, just looking at their body plan, there is way more than meets the eye. Now, for those of you that did draw a beautiful jelly and you are proud of it and you wanna show me, I have a way for you all to do that. So here, once again, if you do wanna take a picture of this slide, all you have to do with your parents' permission, of course, is take a picture of your jelly art. You can even make it way more in depth, maybe add some of their diet, or maybe show how they're singing using their nematocysts, or maybe they have bioluminescence, whatever you created, I would love to see it. You can share it on Instagram or Facebook, but make sure you use the hashtag Port fan art, otherwise I won't be able to see it. So hashtag ports fan art. Show me all of your beautiful jellies. But thank you all again for joining me here today virtually at San Alejo State Beach. You were a wonderful audience. Thank you for all of your engagement and keep thinking like scientists using your observation skills. And don't forget to analyze what you do at home. Stay safe, everyone. I hope to see you next time.